Hi, so this video is about artificial intelligence from the perspective of biosensing and biosensors. So we're going to take a quite a scientific approach to machine learning because at Zimmer and Peacock, we are scientists and engineers. And so the kind of data that we're interested in is not um, the viewing habits of people on Netflix or the buying habits of people on Amazon, but it's more about looking at scientific data. So to sort of start this off, um, start off with a fairly sort of simple, you know, story, let's say. So it's easy to tell the difference between, you know, apples and oranges. And with um, artificial intelligence, the idea is that you can um, teach a, uh, a machine to be able to tell the difference. Um, and because it's a machine, it'll do it so much quicker. In order to do that in, um, in artificial intelligence, we have to sort of teach that machine, you know, so that we can take, so we can use the computing power and the speed of the machine. We effectively have to teach it. Now, at Zimmer and Peacock, we're actually very focused on biosensors. And so the kind of data that we're used to looking at is definitely not the kind of data that um, most learning um, are using. We're using techniques like cyclovoltammetry, um, and cyclovoltammetry is, in so many ways, you could think of it as a simple image. You know, here we have two molecules. Um, they have what's called different cyclovoltammetry, and we're able to use, and we, we could potentially train a um, machine learning algorithm to tell the difference between the two sets of data and classify um, the data according to which molecule causes it. So effectively, you know, machine learning in part is trying to teach, as you know, machines to do what human beings can do. So if you have a PhD in electrochemistry, then you can see the difference between these two um, pieces of raw electrochemical data, and you can um, categorize them accordingly. And now with machine learning, we're starting to be able to teach uh, machines to be able to do the same, except because they're machines, uh, we can give them a lot more data, they can process it a lot quicker, um, and it's, they can carry on processing while the rest of us are asleep. Now, because we are scientists, the data doesn't always come to us in the kind of form of cyclovoltammetry. Sometimes we get the data in the form of maybe images. And here we have two images. They're both of red blood cells underneath a microscope. But in the second image, um, there's a little parasite there called um, Trypnosoma evansi, which is a little um, unfortunately um, parasite that causes um, it causes disease in um, livestock so these two images are pretty similar and an expert could tell them between the two images but those experts have to have holidays they have to have breaks they get tired so it'd be pretty good if we could actually teach a machine to do it as well so here um, the start of this slide was um, artificial intelligence Underneath artificial intelligence, we have machine learning. Machine learning really is really a sort of set of different tools. And we have different tactics and strategies within machine learning. Um, and um, under, underneath machine learning, you have terms like um, deep learning. But today, we'll, we're going to not go too far into deep learning. We're going to stay at a certain level of machine learning. So let's talk about the basics of machine learning. So we have um, satsumas, which maybe I don't like, and we have satsumas, I'm sorry, and oranges, which maybe I do like. Now, um, satsumas and oranges have different um, features or properties. So oranges have tight skin and they're large, and satsumas have loose skin and they're small. Now, if you gave me a, another fruit, maybe I could feel it in my hand and I could tell whether it was large or small and whether it had tight skin or loose skin. And the question is, I can't see it, but is it um, an orange and a satsuma? And because it, because it feels large and it has tight skin, I could classify it as an orange. And I would be right. Now you could give me another fruit and um, actually, it's a little bit, a little bit baggy skinned, but and also a little bit medium in its size, so it's a little bit harder to classify. So is it small or is it 
big. Um, does it have tight skin or loose skin? It sort of sits between the two. But you can use, basically, you can look at um, its neighbors and say, well, in this example, we could say, well, it's close to, let's say, four of the oranges, and it's only close to one of the satsumas. So you can say, well, K, K nearest neighbor algorithm, it's probably it's 80% like an orange and only 20% like a satsuma would be one way of um, describing this. Now that's a machine learning um, algorithm called K nearest neighbors algorithm. So there are different ways of uh, machine learning. You can have supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. With supervised learning, it's like being taught by a teacher. Um, the teacher might give you some um, examples, some flashcards, and they might say, that's a dog, and that's a cat, that's a dog, that's a cat, that's a ball. So they're kind of giving you the input, the data, and they're also giving you the output or the label on it. Um, unsupervised learning, they're just giving you um, examples, and you're going to do something called clustering. And in reinforced um, learning, you're allowed to make predictions and you'll get feedback whether you're right or wrong. And the feedback can help you reinforce your learning so that maybe next time you get it right. So supervised learning is kind of like being taught by a teacher. Unsupervised learning is what we do when we're out observing things and we're kind of learning the patterns of things. And reinforcement learning is when we're kind of practicing things and we're happy to get it wrong. So in this example, for example, um, we've got, um, again, the two images, the red blood cells and the red blood cells with the um, trypanosoma evansi in there. Now, in this, um, we've actually got quite a few of these images, and this is really like a sort of um, a data set. And in the, each one of these images, there's trypanosoma evansi. So what we can do with this is we can um, have the data which is labeled and we say you know that one set of images is trypnosona avanci so we have an input which is the image and a label that says this is positive another set of images and a label that says it's not and therefore these are negatives and in that we can then um, identify a feature so I have a feature here which is this parasite has a certain length and a certain width and in fact, the other objects in these images are all, you know, they're kind of circular. So their length and width is actually um, fairly equal. So we can call that the aspect and that aspect is a feature. When I have an aspect that's approximately five to one, then that's a good sign that that's triplosona avanci. And when I have an aspect that's more like one to one, then that makes me think that it's just a red blood cell. And so we have the feature and we have the label. And what we're doing in supervised learning is teaching the machine to correlate or to couple between the feature and, and the label. So when it sees an object which has an aspect ratio of 5 to 1, then it knows that that's trypnosona avanci. Now with supervised learning, we give it an image, the mach uh, machine learning runs it and, and does a um, a probability that the trip that that is an image of trypanosoma avanci. So we use label data to train the model. Now with unsupervised learning, let me give you an example of that. So um, obviously, you know, in a, in a game of soccer, you can have um, at two ends of the pitch, um, you can have strikers and defenders. I'm not forgetting there's a goalkeeper, but I'm just going to talk about strikers and defenders. Now, strikers and defenders um, have different um, properties or features. So player one, for example, I haven't um, scores lots of goals and only blocks a few goals. Player two scores a lot of lots of goals and just blocks a few goals. Player three doesn't score many goals, um, but blocks a lot of goals. And player four doesn't score many goals, but blocks a lot of goals. So what we have here is 
goal scores and goals blocked. So we have two players who score a lot of goals but don't block them, and two players who don't score a lot of goals but do block a lot of goals. So what we have here is, um, is clustering. So we have a cluster up here and then another cluster down here. And so what we can say here um, is that um, these are really strikers and these are really um, defenders. And so it wasn't labeled, but the um, machine learning has basically clustered them. So if we have a new piece of data and you know we know the goal scored and the goals blocked, then we can see that that, that um, the data according to, associated with that or the features associated with that um, player make them look like a striker, whereas another player might have um, features that make them look like a defender. Now with reinforcement learning, we um, we're allowed to kind of know, you know, when I look at that image, you know, I know that there's Tripnosona Vancey in there. I give it to my machine learning algorithm. It unfortunately gets it wrong, but as long as I'm allowed to feed back and actually say, no, actually that's, you know, that's actually is a positive result. Then ne hopefully next time, that if, that, if that feedback is reinforcing, next time it will actually get it right. So a machine learning model, we have an input, we pass it to the model, we have an output, and if it's wrong, we can feedback and correct it. So I kind of I'll work at um, Zimmer and Peacock. This is just kind of talking about stuff that we're doing internally. You know, we're very good at looking at electrochemical data, for example, um, psychovoltametry, and we're good at gathering that kind of data for different types of molecules. And then we're building um, an internal um, let's say AI um, program called Julie, and Julie then is um, able to help us with um, some of our products, both for ourselves and also for our customers. But basically, at Zimmer and Peacock, we're getting very good at applying artificial intelligence to types of problems that haven't yet been heavily exploited um, when it comes to AI, and that includes. Um, the interpretation of electrochemical data. So, you know, why do I or why do we like AI at ZP? It's because our data can be often only interpreted by a specialist, but our data is quite strong. You know, it's kind of evident that two sets of what we call cyclovoltametry are quite different from one another. And so the um, AI can help us identify that. So we can basically turn what's, you know, what's apparently complicated. Um, raw signals into simpler information. Um, is that raw signal due to that molecule or due to that molecule? And we like it because basically it's turning our sort of expertise in subject, for example, of electrochemical and biosensing into code. And that makes us a lot more um, scalable and useful to our clients. So if you have any um, questions regarding biosensors and sensors and electrochemistry and AI, then please don't hesitate to contact us at Zimmer and Peacock. Okay, thanks very much.